I'm Michael Turkin. I work at Red Hat. I'm a consulting engineer there. And I'm also a chair of the Virtio Technical Committee. So that's the committee that oversees the Virtio specification. So today, I'd like to talk to you about uh, all kind of things that people do with Virtio and the kind of challenges that you encounter when you try to incorporate like very different functionality and very different designs under a single interface, as Virtio does. And um, I hope it will be an interesting study in, in interface design. So really, Virtio is a asymmetrical two-party communication interface. Uh, the first party is called the driver. Sometimes people call it the Virtio driver, unsurprisingly. And it submits some requests to the other party by marking them available. That's the terminology that we use. It's typically implemented in software. There are kernel drivers that implement it. There are user space process drivers that implement it, firmware drivers that implement it. Um, all, kind of, all kind of solutions exist. The other party is called the device. That's the language that the Virtio specifications, specification uses. Um, but some people confusingly also call it the vhost driver. What it does, it uses the request, which just means that it gets them and executes them. So uh, that can live in the hypervisor. That device can be implemented in the Linux kernel. Can be another process, maybe separate from the first one. Um, it can actually be a PCI device. So with that in mind, it really started as a hypervisor interface. I'm not sure it was 2007, but around that time, Rusty wrote that. And um, even though it was originally just, just for communication between guests of a virtual machine and the hypervisor, it very quickly also became an interface for communication between user space and the, the Linux kernel with introduction of the vhost driver. Although it was still typically used for KVM and really virtual machines, and then suddenly, two years after that, uh, people implemented Virtio in hardware for some multimedia offloads. And Rusty said, well, that's a cool and random event. But people just kept reusing that for other stuff, not directly related to virtualization. So people added a vhost user device and a virtio user device. And with that, people started using virtio for communication between two user space processes. And then uh, another hardware offload kind of device appeared, which Intel demonstrated, and they called it a VDPA. They seem set to productize it. So it's really, really not a random event. People do try to use this Virtio interface in all kinds of scenarios that don't have to do anything with virtualization. And it's a valid point then to ask why, why is this going on? So some of it is probably, you know, network effects, like, you know, Facebook. So if you just look at the wealth of software implementing Virtio, that's, that's huge. It has, we have it at all levels of the stack. QMU was one of the first implementations of Virtio, of course. And then uh, the Linux kernel drivers appeared. People implemented Windows kernel drivers as well. Also in user space, DPDK is implementing Virtio, SPDK is implementing Virtio. That's all software. But sometimes you also need firmware, right, for things like booting your operating system. So there are implementations in the BIOS, in UFI, the, the slow firmware. They do things like the, this support for SCSI, Virtio SCSI devices, Virtio block devices, Virtio networking devices for the Pixie driver, and hardware devices, as I mentioned. Um, so. Really, if you are doing a new project, right, you base it around Virtio, you get to join the SICA system and benefit from interacting with these communities, benefit, 
you can benefit from reusing some of that code. So for sure, just how much will you benefit from that would depend on what kind of functionality does your project need, right? But there's a wealth of available functionality. And some of these have been around for a while. A good guys at IBM, Anthony Liguri, Rusty Russell, and others did a lot of work in the early 2000s. So some of these have been around for more than 10 years now. And, and these are widely deployed. So maybe if you use, need something like this, you can just interface with that. And oh, there's a bunch of software you don't need to write, right? So I, I'm not sure I need to go into why standards are good in front of this audience, but just some more arguments if someone needs them. So there are issues if you are using user space drivers with new hardware. So, hey, I'm switching to a different hardware platform. My application is linked with this library which implements a user space driver. So now I need to update this uh, library. Maybe the ABI is stable enough or maybe they released a new major version and this hardware support is over there. Or maybe it's all packaged in you know, a, a container image and I really can't run it on new hardware. So all kinds of issues like that. If you have a standard interface, you can actually maybe just reuse that application. A bit more of a, an idea is that with user space drivers, you don't have, the kernel doesn't get visibility into the state of the hardware. So um, kernel is responsible for things like you know, snapshotting and restoring, for example. And if you can't snapshot and restore your hardware, then maybe that gets broken. So if your hardware follows the spec and your application follows the spec, you can actually figure out what's going on between these guys, right? So there could exist a driver that actually, you stop the application, you figure out the state of the hardware, kind of snapshot it together with the application and restore it. And of course it has more value if you actually can restore on a different hardware platform. So a standard, standard interface would be great for that. That's a bit of a, Theoretical example, but with virtual machines, you have a very similar set of problems, and there are people actually demonstrated solutions. So people have hardware offloads for VTIO, and they actually demonstrated moving between like a hardware solution and a software solution, so really cross vendor. And within a cluster, a mix of, of hardware offloads and, and non offloaded boxes, right, and they just moved VMs around, actually doing live migration, so even without stopping the guest, which is pretty cool, I think. <laughs> so if you're doing a hardware, things like, like user space drivers, for example, pass-through for VMs, bunch of things which you kind of expect from Linux don't work that well. You don't get things like overcommit, so you're limited to amount of interfaces that your hardware have, uh, might have. Um, like there are some ideas how to solve that around scalable IV, but that's not yet deployed. And on the other hand, you know uh, things like member overcommit stop it working suddenly. So you could. If your hardware follows the same interface that's also implemented in software, and we have lots of software implementations for Vertio, right? Then you can actually maybe start with hardware for specific instances which need lots of performance. Then you can switch to a software backend quickly on the fly, right? And then you get all these goodies like swap, et cetera, all maybe with higher CPU utilization but it's there. So, hey, bugs do happen. And exactly who's to blame, right? So we have some tools within the kernel. There are some, some ideas, you know, IMMU can maybe protect you, so 
that the crash will crash the card. But still, even if, it, the, if it's the device that crashes, you're never sure whether it's the driver's fault or the card's fault, right? The specs could be difficult to decipher and understand who's misbehaving here. So if, if you have a, a good spec, I don't know how good ours is, we do try. But that's, that's a definition you can eventually decide who's to blame, where does a fix belong, right? You can also try to swap in a different device if you don't have a different vendor to sell you a card that adheres to the Virtio spec, you can try a software implementations. And there are lots of these. And that's, that's useful for it as a debugging tool. We are actually using it that way. So that's, that's another use. Right, but I think that's not kind of what I said so far is kind of generic. Okay? Any kind of standard for interfaces would be it would have the same properties. There are actually some properties in Virtio which mostly came out of trying to do a good job for KVM. That I just, just made it a, a kind of a nice and successful interface. So some of it is, is a strong focus on compatibility. The fact that we can use PCI optionally for discovery and configuration. The specific part of Virtio that's called the Virtue, I'll describe that a little bit. And really that we have a reasonable process, you know, to extend the specification and standardize new features. So just let's take a look at some of this stuff. So the compatibility part of Virtio is handled by an initialization stage, which is called the feature negotiation. The way it works is a, a, a huge bitmap, which we call the feature bitmap. So a device has this, and the driver has it. And so the driver gets the map from the device, and then just basically does a logical end. And the, the bits that are set in both, these are the features that are supported by the driver and the device. And then we also feed this back into the device. So that, let me show how that works for compatibility. So here's a recent feature that got proposed and is being standardized in the Virtio spec. That's really support for failover. Conceptually, failover idea is that we really have a single device and we expose it as two interfaces to the software. And one is called the standby, and that's a slower one. And the other is the primary, and that's a fast one. So you really want to use a primary if you can. Sometimes you can. You use a standby. That's it at high level. They like have a s it's the same serial number, so you can match them. So that's nice. So we allocated a feature, but with that, it's not really feature bit number zero that's been occupied for like 10 years, but just for simplicity, right? So, okay. Our standby device will be the Virtio device, and that's what we standardize in the Virtio spec. And the primary can be anything. So if you have it, this device that's aware of this new feature and can act as a standby in the failover configuration, then it will have the bitmap which says 0x1, right? So bit, bit zero set, and we updated the drivers. They also have bit zero set. Combine that, all right? We have support, we have a match, right? And they, we feed that to the device and device says, all right, so I can act, I can work on this failover configuration. And that enables better performance. If a, the primary device appears, we can switch to that and improve speed. That's all great, but what about existing setups, right? This probably just have standard with our device. So device has a, zero bit set and the feature bitmap, but the driver doesn't. So the result is it will feed value zero back into the device. Now the device has two options. One would be to say, all right, so I'll just act as a slow virtual device and that's it. There won't be a, a, an ability to do a speed up, but at least we get some kind of networking. That's one option. 
Another is to say, well, I don't want to confuse the users. The, if the only reason I had this virtio thing is, you know, to act as a standby for better stability. But now that you say you don't support that, never mind. Just use the primary and ignore me. So it can fail, and then the driver will not bind to the device. Maybe we could, we actually could suggest to user like, hey, you want to update your guest because the device knows what's going on. So lots of options. It's still, it's not worse than just doing completely new device. We have options, right? Well, what about all devices? That's kind of easy actually, right? The driver goes and pokes at the device and sees, oh, that's not a failover device. Well, what if I want to do failover because, I hey, I have two devices, you know, with the same Mac. Well, maybe I could, you know, just disable one of these two. That's fine. Or I can uh, maybe just notify the user, say, I don't know what's going on. Two devices, which one do you want me to use? Why did you create this configuration? You didn't say it fell over. Two identical serial addresses. What's going on? So again, here's another case study. That's kind of old, right? But we made within QMU a switch to a completely different register layout for all Virtio devices. It happened around 2016. There was a feature bit for that, and not a lot of people noticed. It just worked. You start an old guest, you start an old driver, it works. You start a new one, it also works. You get a slightly more functionality. New functionality, if you want that enabled, will depend on that, but things just work for people. So I think by now we can say we know how to do compatibility. So that's a great success story. And that kind of demonstrates how this, this feature negotiation is helpful for compatibility. So PCI is another thing that was designed originally for simplicity so that people can use a lot of existing software to manage virtual devices. It's not the only option. Some people really don't have support for PCI, but it's widely deployed. So that also makes it easy for people just come and say, oh, I want to do a PCI device. Hey, Virtio can be a PCI device. I'll just do that. Now Red Hat donated their vendor and device ID for use by Virtio. And that really means you can build your device. You just use this pair and Existing drivers will bind. You just follow you know, the spec to the letter. That's it. it. It just works. No software needs to be written. That's, that's great. And existing drivers bind to a device. We get some recycling. That's ecological. Great. That's another um, interesting component within Virtio that just kind of happened. It was designed for hypervisor originally. But the way the communication was designed is that there is this ring in memory accessible to both the device and the driver. The ring is filled with descriptors. We actually have support for multiple formats. Here's one. That's like the latest, the newest one that we added. Well, it has an address. It has a lens field. There's an ID which kind of supports out of order use. So the device can, can use these things in a, in, not in the same order that we, they were supplied by the driver. And you use the idea to figure out which one was, was written by the device. And there's flags that basically marks it available or not available to the device. Some other minor things. But really, you look at to this, that's basically what any standard hardware, DMA-capable hardware does. They all do this. No big deal. So it was very easy for people to say, well, we can use this format. Why not? It's just generic enough. 
to probably support a lot of existing hardware functionality without issues. Other things that we could have done and what didn't, right, and make it easier for hardware to do is we could have done some shared locks with hypervisor. That would have made it tricky. It's lucky that the notifications that are sent between the driver and device are basically just a wake up call. Hey, there's some stuff in that ring. And that you can do like interrupts, which don't pass a lot of data around, you know, for communication between the driver and the device. So that, that, that structure really makes it possible for people to do hardware, for people to do software. It's just, it's just simple and generic. So that's another successful thing. So let's say I convinced you and you're going to build your new project around Virtio. Well, congratulations. But what if you can't just reuse all existing stuff, right? Then do I really have to write the spec that's a lot of work? Well, eventually it's the right thing to do, right? Because then people can find out how your stuff works and then can interoperate. But you don't have to start with that. That's not our priority. In, in the Virtaio, we really want to enable new stuff, not kind of blocks So what's our priorities. So we focus on compatibility at lots of levels. So people worry about compatibility at the code level, um, which is really mean not breaking other projects. IPR, which is just says, allow others to do the same thing, right? And also just compatibility at the level of the interface so we can extend things for further. So code compatibility is really simple. I think we have like the lightest version of all um, standards organizations that I have been in touch with for proposing comments. So formally what you do, you comment on the specification. That's, that's um, like the channels through which you support it. But really that means there is a Virtio comment mailing list and you send a patch there. We really want people to structure their comments as patches outside of the public review process, which happens once a while. We'll get to that. And then we have to accept all kinds of weird stuff like Word documents. But if you want to get your stuff there, send us a patch. It's in LaTeX, not too bad. You do need to install that huge software package to make sure people can actually generate PDFs out of that. But if it's a new device, the most important thing is to make sure that others don't use the same ID. So we have a single driver binding to your device. So we send a patch and reserve an ID. We are not short on ideas. It's easy to reserve one. Come up with a reasonable name. We'll put it on the spec. If it's extending an existing device, it's also not too bad. You reserve a feature bit. We'll want a, at least a vague description of what this stuff does instead of my new project. But we are not too hard to get through. So hey, you say, this, this feature is not yet described, but this bit is reserved for that feature. And we do it. There are right now drivers support 64 bits. We are using like 40, so we are still not short on bits. And we can extend it. It's all control pass. So it's not really a problem to extend that further when we start running out of feature bits. So far, we didn't. So once you do that, how do you do it in the spec? Git clone, make sure you can build this change specification, generate PDF. You need to subscribe to the mailing list. When you do, it will ask you basically, we have a non-assertion mode. Please promise you will not sue people for using this stuff you are trying to put in the spec. And you say, okay. And then you send a patch to the mailing list and just give people a little bit of time to comment. And once everyone's happy with that, 
then you can ask to vote on the ballot. We, right now, we are using GitHub issues to track you know, outstanding things that needs to be voted on. So I started asking people, please, please send a fix it, fixes tag. And then when the patch goes in, the issue gets closed automatically. That's nice. So overall, let's say you give people about a week to comment, and the voting takes a week. Within two weeks, you can put it in the spec draft. So really, oh, IPR is just means we don't discuss things behind closed doors. We don't have calls. We vote in the electronic ballot. You just click a button. That's it. You have about a week to vote. People that do want to contribute have to post their stuff on the mailing list. You can add stuff in GitHub issues. We will not vote on it. You can have discussion there if you like. But we only vote if there is a link in the issue to the mailing list archives. So right now, the, we have Virtio memory and the IMMU that kind of in the middle of this process. And um, input device, a GPU device went through this, was pretty smooth. Did take a little while, GPU is pretty big. Well, you get into interface compatibility once your stuff is already in the spec. So you don't want to break it. So if you're like doing changes, we tend to tell people, do a new feature bit. Don't just suddenly start requiring new stuff. If you want like a completely new set of functionality, you can post it as a comment. If it's huge, you probably won't, don't you want to vote on your, what people think on your baby, or do you just trust us to do a good job? All right. It's not too hard. If you do want to vote, you need to be a member. Membership in Oasis does incur uh, membership fees to defray administrative costs. Sorry about that. But we do try to be fair uh, to comments by non-members. We do ask people to try and actually document assumptions. So there will be you know, just a generic description in English. And then we'll try to say, all right, now try to have a small chapter that says, you must do ABC, right? And these are optional features, so you may do CDE, so stuff like that. So we added the crypto device recently like that. It was a bit light on, on the number of keywords. I'm not sure what, where the line exactly is. Some people think the Muslim area, right? But at some level, we do try to be practical. We, I think most of the committee agrees that it's better to have a specification, even if it's kind of light on the you know, specific requirements from the device, at least you do have a description there. And then we can improve and iterate with a every release. How we get one time? Yeah, fine. Sorry? Five minutes left. Uh, okay, let's try to skip some stuff. <laughs> so uh, we are trying, we're looking at two, some optimizations that are actually helpful for hardware. So if you have a, a hardware card, right now you need to go in and look at the number of available descriptors. And that, that's an extra round trip across the PCI bus. You issue a read, you wait for response. It's not the case for hypervisors. So for these devices, we may be adding some extra information. When you do tell the card, here are some new descriptors. We can add extra information that says, and that's how many descriptors there are. So that, that's one example of things we are working on. Some interesting optimizations. So if you have a hardware card, you need on some platforms pretty strong memory barriers to synchronize the way your, your stuff goes into memory, such that when the card goes and, and fetches it, it actually gets a consistent image. If it's a software implementation, it's lighter weight. Uh, on the one hand, CPUs are typically kind of strongly ordered, and they usually have like lighter weight synchronization primitives for, for SMP effects. Also, uh, if you do notify another CPU that something's going on, it's typically an interrupt that already includes a, um, 
a strong barrier, so we probably don't need an extra one. Um, let's skip this one. So some people ask, what are we gonna do if I have a hardware bug? So, hey, maybe don't. And then maybe, maybe you can disable that feature. So I suggest people maybe, you can have maybe just a bit of EEPROM on your card that just controls which features you expose. Just the feature bitmap. And so if you find a bug in this specific feature, you can maybe tweak that bit and disable that part. And all right, and the next pin will do it correctly. Well, if it's something major, do try to put it in the spec. Maybe it's not a bug, maybe it's actually a feature. Who knows? We can actually talk about, like some people might want to say, I'll just do my own driver. I realized Virtio is not a good fit now that I put it out there. So we can blacklist the specific vendor. Sure, do your own driver, no problem. Uh, let's skip these things. This just shows like the rate of change. I, I, I started with trying to list like all the stuff we did in the last year. That's just a sundry list of, of huge list of small things. So that's m like my inbox today. That's what we are going on today. So we, people are working on page hinting capability in Balloon. GPU uh, adds monitor reporting support. And networking people want to do more aggressive coalescing of packets of different lands and act coalescing. And the block device people want to implement this card and write zero support. So that's like one day in Vertigo. It's really busy. Lots of people working on this. Now let, let, let me wrap up and just tell you about our plans. So we do plan to freeze our spec for a while. We didn't see a reason to, but people are coming and saying we are doing this hard. We want to po point out that our hardware device implements this specific version of the spec. So to release the spec so we can tell these people what it's doing. So we'll start the process. Um, basically, end of month, I get back from LPC, do a bit of administrative stuff, and we'll freeze it, and we'll ask Oasis to start the public review process. Takes them a while. By end of year, they should really start the, the public review. It needs to run for one month, so we'll wrap up early next year. If, as happened for, for several uh, in the past, we just get, you know, typo fixes, then we can release early next year. If people suddenly start complaining and we need to do lots of changes, we might need to do another re round of public review. That next one might be shorter, it's just a bug fix. So to summarize, right, we have network effects. We have unique properties that makes compatibility easy with Virtio. So there's this large ecosystem that you can join. It's easy to extend and a lot of going on. So join the fun. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Yes, five minutes. Um, the, the feature negotiation thing, uh, how well does it deal with renegotiation at runtime? And the, the typical cases are you know, your firmware driver doesn't have the same features than your kernel driver, or you might key exec from one kernel to another, etc. So right now it's pretty straightforward. You do all the feature negotiation, you say feature negotiation done, you can start using the device, you want to do it again, you do a reset. There's a special register to do this lightweight reset that just makes you restart the fish negotiation. Some people think that even that is too heavyweight and want to do it dynamically. No one proposed that in the spec. It's, it's def it shouldn't be too hard. Uh, you mentioned the implications of barriers for hardware information. Oh, hardware implementations. What about cache coherency for non-coherent platforms? So, 
Right, so we have, it's just a solved problem, so I didn't mention that. But yes, we have, so the, the trick is that cache currency within Linux is solved by the DMA API. And so, and we did need to add ability to work, to go through DMA API, or not go through DMA API if you are just talking to another CPU in the past. So we already have a feature flag that tells you whether you're going through DMA API or not. That includes the recurrence thing. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.